Welcome, World Civ class, to another edition of, of this course. This week we're recording from uh, McGowan here at Montreat College. Our topic this week is Enlightenment Rules. Well, in your textbook, you were reading about the sort of global enlightenment. This week, we're going to focus particularly on the European story, a more traditional story. But we'll investigate the, the way the Enlightenment was also sort of a project that has consequences over the lives we live. We'll then look at the new world of science, and we'll look at these philosophers like Voltaire and the way that philosophy changed politics. Finally, we'll turn our attention to revolutionary women and uh, your open LMS uh, discussing the past post this week. We'll be choosing um, a particular woman, Mary Wollstonecraft, Soldier in Truth, Eugène Angelique, Quixin, uh, Bahiat al Badia, and explore how they were pushing for women's rights in the 1800s. Um, before we dive into lecture, two notes. Uh, your, there is a paper coming up um, that will be due in sort of mid-March, so I'll introduce that paper in next week's session, uh, and the dates are a little bit different from the syllabus, so I'm moving the paper back around one week. So don't worry about that this week. Uh, you also have a quiz coming up, um, and that's posted on the OpenLMS website. It'll be open till next Tuesday. That is February 16th. All right, let's dive into our topic this week. So our first conversation is, what exactly is, uh, and what do you mean by the phrase, the Enlightenment Project? Well, listen, between roughly 1600 to the early 1800s, there are a group of individuals, predominantly from Europe, who are champion, championing new ideas, but championing faith in, in reason. Uh, human rationality is big here. They're rejecting social distinctions. Um, no more difference between aristocrats and the commoners. You see this to some extent in the, the French Revolution, a topic we'll discuss next week. They are big fans of religious toleration, and yet they also tend to presume that religion will fade from public life. Uh, and this they will prove to be incorrect. They're also looking for sort of laws to sort of human behavior. They're looking at commerce and, and rationality in new ways. They're generally big adopters of something we might call it capitalism. And listen, you might agree with many of these things, uh, but there's also to some extent a darker side of the Enlightenment. Uh, they weren't afraid of pushing cultural hierarchy and racial, racial dominance. Um, and you see this in, in really tragic ways as it exerts its influence in the 20th century. It's not a shock to me, at least, that in, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, you have European philosophers like Adorno and Horkheimer say this drive to reduce everything to instrumental rationality outstripping is outstripping ethics, and the end result is the Holocaust. So that, according to some, is one tangible effect of the Enlightenment. Another one, of course, is the science that brought the astronauts to the moon in 1969. So we're truly dealing with uh, complexity here. But this is a project in as much that sort of the rules uh, and norms that these folks set exert a really strong influence over the lives that we live. So um, let's jump through a series of questions about what exactly uh, this Enlightenment project is and how is it happening before we jump into some of the key individuals? Who's participating in this? Uh, particularly men. Uh, women were often excluded from, from this project, but it, it's uh, kind of rising middle-class men in you know, predominantly France, uh, Britain, what becomes Germany, and of course the United States. So it's men in the Atlantic world. Who's not really participating? Um, when the ideas come to uh, the Far East, to the Ming Empire in China, they reject it. In North Africa and the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire also largely rejects these ideas. Of course, these ideas become sort of part and parcel of what we call modernity. Um, 
And there's been this sort of battle and engagement with modernity all around the world uh, in the 300 years after these ideas become commonplace. So what makes it possible? Uh, what makes this sort of period of European enlightenment or discovery possible? Well, part of it is due to this uh, new wealth created by global trade. Uh, in recent weeks, we have discovered the ways Europeans, uh, you know, travel to the Far East, to Japan, to the Americas, right? And how a lot of money is now flowing into Europe from trade and also foreign extraction of things, especially like silver. So there's some new wealth. With new wealth, you can sort of invest in new industries and in new intellectual feats. There's also a lot more international contact. Uh, you know, Europeans are trading a lot with people from the Middle East, and there's a whole bunch of borrowing happening and, and sometimes stealing. Uh, so, for example, geometry, as you can see in the slide, makes its way from Persia to, to Europe. Um, the game of chess moves from India to the Middle East to Norway and then to England and then, of course, the world. It's also a period of global security. China, the Islamic world, Africa, Europe, they're not really threatened with foreign takeover. And their educated and artistic groups continue to affirm the validities of their own ways. So there's a sense of stability. And listen, for the rest of the story, we're going to focus on what's going on in Europe. But this is not to say that there isn't a good bit of flourishing occurring in Africa. Uh, tons of flourishing happening in the Middle East, in India and Asia, right? This is when the Taj Mahal, for example, is constructed. So this is ultimately a global story. And you read a lot about that global story in your textbook this week. Um, we can't talk about everything. I'm going to pick and choose to talk about what's happening in Europe. So in Europe, where is this enlightenment happening? Like, what are the spaces? How does this work out? It's happening in uh, what's called salons, uh, in private gatherings known as salons. Often these were hosted, like the one depicted here, by aristocratic women. Uh, in this case, this uh, Madame Geoffrin was a famous hostess. And women could operate as hostesses, if not really full-fledged participants here. But they'd welcome down at the hills writers and artists, offering everyone, at least in theory, the opportunity to discuss science, the arts, politics, and the idiocies of their fellow humans on an equal basis. These discussions are all also occurring um, at something called the Coffee House. Coffee uh, discovered in you know the early 1500s in what is today Yemen. Uh, makes you kind of caffeine and buzzed up, right? Uh, Europeans didn't take to the drink at first. They called it the Muslim alcohol. It was haram. They kind of banned it. Eventually, it becomes very popular. Uh, right after hot chocolate becomes really, really popular. And these sort of alternate spaces to sort of taverns and pubs open up. And this is where men go to sort of discuss the news and the events and the ideas of the day. This is the public sphere where more regular folks are coming together to discuss matters of the world. This is a world that's uh, largely still excluding women, um, but this is where it's happening. It's also happening in royal academies. These are institutions funded by Europe's monarchs. Um, and listen, they're increasing literacy in Europe, they're spreading these ideas. Uh, most of the work they're doing is kind of what we today call the military industrial complex. Uh, you know, they're, they're figuring out how to make better cannibals and they're, they're helping farmers figure out how to flip the land faster. Um, so a lot of it is sort of a national improvement. The most famous academy is the Royal Academy of London, uh, which eventually is run by a gentleman named Isaac Newton. You may have heard of him. But all uh, many countries around the world have these royal academies. Right. And we still have, of course, something like this in the United States. There's all sorts of government institutions that investigate science here in Asheville. Um, there is the National Center for Environmental Information, or NOAA. Uh, they employ a good number of people. Guess what? They also have a lot of internships for uh, science and perhaps business and really any majors. That Go ahead and check out their website and see um, if you're interested in a paid internship. Some of them even waive tuition. So opportunities for students at Monterey College. And uh, the largest of these institutions is, in America at least, is uh, the National Institute of, of Health. 
which is run by a gentleman named Francis Collins. This guy happens to be uh, Fauci's boss. Uh, and he every year he gets to spend $41 billion on scientific research and all sorts of projects. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll talk about sort of this uh, sometimes awkward legacy between science and Christianity. Well, Francis Collins happens to be an evangelical Christian who's buddies with a famous theologian named N.T. Wright. He plays the guitar at church. He quotes C.S. Lewis nonstop. So, and he's been in this role since uh, the Bush administration. So Bush, Obama, Trump, and now President Biden have kept him in this role. So uh, he is the most powerful scientist in the world. He happens to be the one who broke the Human Genome Project, right? So you can get your DNA testing for a few hundred dollars online. That's this guy, that's how he made his name. Um, but if you have qualms about science and religion not working together, the most powerful scientist in the world happens to be a uh, card-carrying evangelical Christian. Okay, uh, where did this where did this happen? Um, it's also happening, so salons, it's happening in coffee houses, it's happening in these rural academies, it's happening in these new sort of bookstore areas. Uh, countries have different sort of centers of where books are bought and sold. In England, there's famously a place called Grub Street in London, which at the time was not very fancy, but uh, you know, they're, they're publishing books and people are buying, they're often very expensive. Um, and for these book publishers to make it work, they're often selling really body books uh, with titles like, you know, The Nun and the Priest Off in the Woods. <laughs> these, are, these are essentially uh, pornography. So pornography, uh, the sale of pornography is kind of funding the sale of uh, more highfalutin enlightenment books. Okay, so these are sort of the spaces where enlightenment happens. Okay, how did these new understandings um, in science, so what, what, what happens is that in the space of science, it's really sort of launching uh, the Enlightenment. Now, this study used to be called the Scientific Revolution, and it certainly is revolution, but revolution is kind of a, a strong term to make. A lot of these ideas take decades, even hundreds of years to become readily adopted, so it doesn't really happen overnight. Now, we sometimes talk more about this new world of science, a more poetic way to frame what's happening. But this is a story that traditionally begins with an Englishman uh, named Francis Bacon. He's a philosopher, statesman, scientist, jurist, orator, author, in these days period in multiple, multiple roles. He serves as Lord of the Chancellor for a while. But he invents this method of inquiry based on experimentation in nature. Right? Bacon claimed real science entails the formulation of hypotheses that could be tested in carefully controlled experiments. And this process repeats itself over and over and over again uh, to iron down your hypothesis. Well, everyone loves this idea and sort of catches hold. And people take this and look to the stars. Right? Over in Poland, there's a gentleman named Co Copernicus who's looking at the stars and he's beginning to sort of subtly posit that we live in a solar system, that perhaps the sun is the center of the solar system, and the earth is maybe only the third planet in a solar system. Uh, now, he believed that the planets moved in circles. Galileo, and uh, what is today, Italy, is doing the same thing. And he's like, no, man, they actually move in stars. But he sort of confirms uh, what's called the heliocentric theory. Now, at the time, the Catholic Church, uh, which uh, often viewed itself as being sort of science forward, thought this was heresy. They put him on trial. Galileo's forced to convert. He's put under house arrest. And this becomes sort of a stain on... Catholic, Catholic Church, indeed, on Christianity. And there's been these perceived tensions between the faith and science um, ever since, even if on the big perspective, uh, there's not really a large tension. Now, someone who's taking ideas of Bacon and Galileo and thinking about planets is a gentleman named Sir Isaac Newton. He was born in 1642. When he's your age, uh, when he's in his early 20s, he puts all these ideas together as an undergraduate at Cambridge. Uh, that's where he posits the idea of gravity. And listen, let me be technically complex here. This is how he plays it out. Uh, from this idea of gravity, he has these three laws of motion. A, everybody at rest or in motion remains so unless until a force is applied to it. B, the change in motion is proportional to the force exerted. C, every action produces, you know this one, an opposite reaction. So ideas of gravity and inertia are, are developed here. And he's developing a, a math called calculus to, to make this all work out. And he publishes these findings in 1687 in a book 
uh, called Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, better known as Principia. But the larger sort of underlying notion is that God's universe runs according to natural laws that were unchanging, rational, mathematical, and discoverable using the scientific method. Now, it's fascinating about Newton is that he does all this in his early 20s. He becomes the head of the Royal Academy of London. So he has a job kind of like Francis Collins in America, um, encouraging other scientists to break new ground. But much of his work, um, some have estimated 70% of his life is spent working with alchemy, right? Trying to turn objects into gold. Of course, uh, it doesn't work out for him. But just still to remind you that kind of like Christopher Columbus, this is a person who's both very, very modern, like we modern today, but also sort of part of this older medieval, medieval world. Now, someone who really represents what's going on in the world of science is... Uh, an explorer, a naturalist uh, named Captain Cook. Now, from 1769 to 1779, he goes on these three routes to the Pacific. And listen, technically, um, these routes are sort of a failure because uh, he's looking for this great southern continent, which doesn't exist. He's also looking for an, uh, an ice-free northwest passage from Europe to China, which doesn't exist. But he really symbolized, and listen, he proves these don't exist, right? But he really symbolized this age. Um, he's sponsored by uh, the Royal Society and the British Crown. On uh, his journeys, he's bringing with a whole bunch of naturalists to a drawing everything. Um, like, for example, Joseph Banks, right? You may have seen these in, uh, in you know, decorating people's homes. Uh, over 3,000 drawings of plants, birds, landscapes, and peoples un unknown to Europeans were were produced during this trip. Um, you know, he's bringing in new science techniques like, hey, everyone, let's exercise in the boat and eat lemons so no one gets scurvy. Only one person died of disease, which is almost unheard of on, on his journeys. But more importantly, he is uh, discovering for Europeans um, much of the Pacifica, including famously Australia. So, he, you know, he's not, he's, you know, he's writing about kangaroos, um, killing them and eating them and telling people they taste horrible. Let's not do this. Uh, but he opens up this region to, to European influence and indeed domination, specifically British domination. Now he himself becomes sort of a hero to this cause when in 1779, uh, in near Tahiti, some locals steal a boat of his, and in an effort to bring back his boat, he is captured and killed. But uh, far and wide, young British boys and girls especially were into stories of the HMS Endeavour. And soon, people were heading to Australia. That's where the British sent, at first, their prison population. Eventually, this population grows in places like Sydney, um, and they prosper with, with hard work and figuring out that they can raise sheep there. It's also quite a sad story for the local inhabitants as the Aborigines um, are persecuted. Uh, in some ways, there's sort of a small scale genocide of the local peoples there. You know, New Zealand also opens up to, to European influence as whites begin to sort of dominate that beautiful island, uh, even though the Maori people can continue to live there. One fascinating story here, which I'll briefly mention, is the story of Captain William Bly and the HMS Bounty. So in the middle of the 1800s, um, as they're hanging out near Tahiti, Tahiti um, a sailor named Christian Fletcher leads a revolt, a mutiny. So Captain Bly and his lieutenants are put on a boat. They travel 3,000 miles to Timor, which is in Indonesia. It takes 47 days, they survive, and they live the tale this tale of the mutiny on the Bounty, which in the early 20th century was made into about seven or eight films. Fletcher, uh, they're freaked out. They, they, they leave, they grab some local women, and they settle in Pitcair Island, um, where eventually they fight other women, uh, there's massacres, eventually only one white man is left standing by 1814. Uh, but you can still visit this place uh, uh, if you take a really exotic cruise about once a month, the cruise ship docks in Pitcairn Island, where there's a small population. And apparently, 
they are still inviting. They're still seeking people. So if you want to drop everything today, there's an open invitation by the people of Pitcairn Island to uh, live on that land, to farm the land. From what I'm told, it's a pretty miserable, barren existence. Uh, but paradise is there if you if you want it. Now, in the world of science, I want to close on a sort of tragic note, and that is um, a complex one. There's a Swedish scientist, naturalist named Carl Linnaeus. He died in 1778. But he is kind of the father of modern taxonomy, right? In biology class, you learn about, you know, all these different plants and animals in the classification system. But um, we shouldn't be shocked, uh, but indeed it is a really a modern day tragedy in the ways he identified five groups of Homo sapiens. And he classified people according to their physical characteristics and social qualities. He said Europeans were, quote, light-skinned and governed by laws. The Asians were sooty-skinned and regulated by opinion. See the difference? It continues. Native Americans were copper-skinned and governed by custom. Africans, the lowest on its rung, were dark-skinned and ruled by personal whim. Now, what happens is that race becomes the scientific category. It's, today, it's, you know, it's not viewed as a scientific category. It's you're an extremely damaging cultural construction, which leads to you know, the justification of slavery and, in the end, the Holocaust. Um, but this, um, so with the Enlightenment, you also have the invention of the concept of, of race and modern-day racism. All right. So with science, we, we eventually get the moon. We also get slavery, a renewed justification for it. So, um, what about the intellectuals? Uh, what about the ideas, folks, guys? And they were they were all guys, unfortunately, for the most part. Uh, what were they pushing? Um, here, the centers of energy are in France and and Britain predominantly. So, in France, uh, there's a gentleman named Denis, as in Denis the Menace, Denis Denis Diderot lives in the 18th century, and he really believes you need to banish bigotry and superstition. One way we can do this is by sort of popularizing all these all this new science, and he believed we can do it through the encyclopedia. Or encyclopedia. Uh, he eventually edits 28 volumes from 1751 to 1775. And here's the title page of the encyclopedia, right? Uh, features an image of light and reason being dispersed throughout the land. So it's really kind of a, an ory object. Here's another image from this page. This is an engraving from the 1772 edition, uh, where the encyclopedia is viewed as truth at the top center and surrounded by light and unveiled by, by the figures to the right, which are representing philosophy and, and reason. But once you dug into the encyclopedia, what you actually get is a lot of sort of uh, how to do things. So um, here you can see directions of how to make a pin. And when this is published, there's one pin making factory in Lyon in France. Now, what happens is that a whole bunch of young entrepreneurs are like, this might be a good thing to have. So in Prussia or in Milan or in northwest France, young people are saying, maybe we can also make pins. We have the directions of how to do this. So, you know, at first it's kind of very wealthy, kings and queens, and rich people buying it, but eventually kind of young people put their money together and they kind of start new new companies and they bring in more, more competition. You should also know that the encyclopedia is nearing the end of its heyday. Uh, way back in 2012, uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica stopped the presses, they stopped printing it. Uh, you can actually find, you know, one thing I think is a, a fun thing to do is, you know, as you're moving into your first apartment, you need some decorations, uh, take a look on eBay at encyclopedias from the year of your birth. Kind of a fun thing to have, perhaps, you know, maybe for some of you, it's 01, 02, or 03, or 04. Um, I just took a recent look just before class, and you can you can buy these for, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 dollars uh, with a little bit of for shipping. So uh, you too can be the owner of an encyclopedia. All right. So Dennis Diderot is popularizing this. 
new science. Another popularizer is Voltaire, uh, who really becomes the most famous man of the Enlightenment. His name is François-Marie Arouet. He was born in France in 1694 as a young writer. He is sent to the Bastille for satirical writings, critical writings about the government. He writes stuff like this, you know, monks, they sing, they eat, they digest. So, I mean, that's kind of banal, but he's viewed as kind of critical towards the crown. Eventually, he's released from his prison. Uh, he goes to England, and in England, he's amazed at the relative intellectual freedom, the tolerance of different religious beliefs, and the openness of political life. So, and he discovers Newton. He gets back home. He teams up with his lover, a woman named Emilie du Châtelet, who's a real genius. She had translated Newton's Principia Mathematica uh, into French, and he sort of uh, writes a Cliff Notes version of this, which becomes really, really popular. Um, now, this is Voltaire's uh, lover for a time period, but his views of her also sort of tragically encapsulate the views of many Enlightenment men towards women. This is what Voltaire said about his lover. She was a great man whose only fault was being a woman. All right, so chuckle, chuckle, right? This is, this is funny, of course, but it's also embedding a really deeper sort of tragedy that women were marginalized and pushed to the sides in this movement, um, even as Voltaire was the star of all these salons. But I want to uh, discuss uh, in a few minutes the story of his most famous book, the most famous book of the Enlightenment um, called Candide. Ooh, there we go. So Candide was written in 1759. Immediately, it's uh, a European hit. Uh, translations pop in all countries weeks after it's originally published in, in French. It's... Uh, kind of a picaresque novel. It's a building's roman, right? The story about a young person's education. And there's there's really a lot of sort of body, potty humor in this. But in this book, he's attacking all sorts of institutions. He's attacking intolerance, superstition. Uh, eventually, when this is published, he has to leave France uh, in exile. But the story is about a young man named Candide, who will travel all across the 17th century world. And Candide has this professor named Pangloss, who goes around saying, um, all is best in the best of all possible worlds. In other words, things happen for a larger good reason. It's a sort of version of like secular providence. And throughout this book, all these terrible things happen to Candide and, and his friends. So back at home, the story starts off with Candide uh, falling in love with his cousin. Um, and he's kicked out of the castle by her, her father. And he's forced to fight in these terrible wars where there's cannibalism, which really represents the Thirty Years' War in Europe. Eventually, he gets caught in these huge earthquakes and storms in Lisbon, which really had happened five years earlier. There was a huge earthquake in Lisbon, where first there was an earthquake, and then there was a 40-foot tsunami which hit the city. 80,000 people died in the first day of this epic tragedy. And this was the first like global news story, uh, as the newspapers had just kind of come into existence. And... You know, Candide is put on trial, um, eventually makes his way to South America. He finds El Dorado, but he's still looking for his lost love, Cunegonde. But on this trip, he, at the very, right before this book was published, he threw in a story he had heard about a black man in Northeast South America in a region called Suriname. And here you can see an image where Candide uh, sees a young black man missing several limbs. And he asks him what happened here. And this is what he says. This is what the slave said. When we work in the sugar mills and get a finger caught in the machinery, they cut off the hand. But if we try to run away, they cut off a leg. I have found myself in both situations. This is the price we pay for the sugar you eat in Europe. So all of a sudden you have all these lovely English housewives, right? Think of like these Jane Austen housewives who are reading this and say, oh my goodness, what is happening with all this sugar trade? This is horrendous. And they actually have sort of a human rights campaign. They, they stop making pies with sugar. Uh, and this is 
a reason, not the only reason, but this is a reason for sort of the launch of the abolition movement, the fight to end slavery. Listen, in the end, they end up in foreign territory in Constantinople and Muslim lands, and they're all there. And what's his advice? His advice is to relax, to be chill. All I know, said Candide, is that we must cultivate our garden. Right? So everyone has this French phrase, il faut cultiver notre jardin. Listen, man, buckle down and do the work that's in front of you. This is a solution to the problem of, of evil, which perhaps is not all that different than the, the problem of evil that was facing Job in the Hebrew scriptures. Remain calm and be faithful. It's not our job, our job to try to explain how evil happens. All right, moving through these world of philosophers, 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 or philosophes in the French. Uh, and I'm going to go relatively quickly here. I just want you to give, give you a sense of who these individuals are. You'll have a copy of these slides as well. But uh, in France, uh, there's a nobleman named Baron Montesquieu. Uh, he's writing The Spirit of the Laws in 1748, in which he argues that the best government is a mix, separate, and it balances elements of the monarchy, the aristocracy. Listen, you know how the story probably ends. Uh, eventually, some Americans are very intrigued by these writings. And when they create the United States Constitution, uh, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams and company, they're all like, yes, Montesquieu, judicial branch, legislative branch, executive branch. They will all sort of balance each other out. Over in France, you have someone who did push the boundaries of the Enlightenment named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, there's a lot of ideas spring forth from Rousseau, but I'll mention two of them. Uh, he writes a story of uh, Emile, in which he argues that the educational system um, should emphasize freedom of expression, self-discovery, kind of be your own person, find your own truth. Uh, these, of course, are very modern ideas. He also writes uh, that same year, a text called The Social Contract, which in which he contends that big states are naturally corrupt and corrupting of the human spirits. He really is a fan of smaller states or small government, you might say. But he argues that government policy should, should follow the general will of the people, right? This is, of course, the cornerstone of sort of democratic theory. It's also um, can be used quite tragically. Eventually, Adolf Hitler would say, I am the general will of the people, right? That ends, of course, very poorly. Over in Britain, uh, a bit earlier, we have John Locke uh, saying people are born with a clean slate, a tabula rasa, and he's pushing for new political rights uh, that everyone inherently has through natural rights. They have a right to life, a right to liberty, uh, a right to property. Right? Seven years later, Thomas Jefferson will, will, will rebrand these rights as a right to life, liberty, and happiness. Adam Smith. Uh, is also part of the Enlightenment, right? Adam Smith is considered the father of modern capitalism. In 1776, a hot year, he writes The Wealth of Nations, in which he's looking for these laws that Newton had found in nature that would regulate economics, um, like the hidden hand of the market, for example. We'll talk more about Adam Smith uh, when we talk about Marx in a few weeks. Uh, in the States, Benjamin Franklin, kind of like Voltaire, is this great popular, right? Someone who believes in the new modern capitalism as he's setting up his print shop. Someone who retires at the age of 44 and turns his attention to science, right? Conducting experiments uh, with a kite, according to, to myth, right? But he's the one who figures out that lightning is, in fact, electrified air. So modern electricity is flowing from his work. Then he turns his attention to diplomacy, ensuring uh, a new constitution and protecting America for the world. And in the end, he becomes sort of this figure for, for all humanity. So how do these uh, ideas influence politics? Oh, many, many ways. But let me give you a few very brief examples. Over in Russia, uh, a region that we won't cover in great detail in this course, there's a great czar, czarist reformer named Catherine the Great, a former German princess who comes to the throne after overthrowing her husband. She had read a large number of philosophers, and she attempts to reform and to westernize Russia. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. For example, she tries to eliminate the serfs. These are basically a class of 
uh, almost slave-like peasants. Uh, it doesn't work out, but progress is attempted in Russia as it looks towards Europe. Over in Prussia, right, a region that becomes Germany with its headquarters in Berlin, the ruler Frederick the Great is modernizing Prussian law, kind of laying the groundwork for a new German state. He's promoting capitalism, agriculture, immigration, education. This guy sympathizes with the American Revolution, he pays the plant flute. In Austria, Joseph II does free the serfs, and he's modernizing the country there. Of course, there's also more intense revolutionary influences, right? In the United States, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and company, Madison, others, Hamilton, right? They uh, push for independence and eventually create a constitution with a lot of these ideas flowing from the Enlightenment. In France, as we'll discover next week, uh, the same occurs in 1789. Uh, even if the story is a much more violent one in this case. But what about the women? How did revolutionary ideas about gender change the status of, of women? Here I want to talk briefly about sort of some terms, and uh, I'll introduce this assignment in around three or four minutes. So uh, it's important to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about women, sex, and, and gender. Um, so let's play with these terms that you've probably heard before. So uh, sex is the biological term, right? Male, female, of course, some people are, have been historically born as intersex, um, but those are sort of scientific categories. Gender is a term that uh, became more popular in the 1980s, a very controversial term. Uh, but this is this idea that uh, what it means to be male or female does change over time and takes on different meanings in different places. Now, listen, I, I think there is a spectrum of how you engage with this, right? On one level, you can, pardon me. Now, as I said, gender is a controversial term, right? There's essentialists who believe these categories never change. There are folks who have a bit more flex in these categories, um, but it, it is this idea that you know, gender uh, is partially culturally constructed by, by culture. Uh, I, I don't think that's that controversial an idea. I think even if you happen to be, you know, more conservative on sort of gender relations, this shouldn't be a shock, right? Um, that ideas of what it, what it means to be a man or what it means to be feminine does flex a little bit. You know, for example, pink and purple used to be the masculine colors. So, Sex is biological. Gender um, is sort of the knowledge of, of sexual difference, um, what, what is perceived to be masculine or feminine at any given time. And in this Enlightenment period, in early periods, the public sphere is uh, the world associated with men, with politics, with leadership roles, with head of family, with the world of the pubs and the coffee houses. The private sphere is associated with women. Um, with the domestic, with the home, with caretakers, with nurturers, um, also with morals. So, uh, listen, as you know, if you happen to be Christian, or right, Christians all around the world have, uh, you know, common, you know, they might have some different ideas about how gender relates, whether women can be pastors and so forth, but they all agree that uh, men and women are made in the image of God, right? To quote Galatians 3.28, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free male, and female, for you are all one in, in Christ. But to me, looking at gender historically is, is really fascinating because it, it helps explain some things. Let me give you a few examples before I jump back to these revolutionary women. All right, so uh, here we see um, an image in San Francisco in the 1890s. All right, so these are Asian Americans who are doing doing laundry. Now, you probably know that uh, the Asian American community is synonymous with the laundry business in America. Um, but gender sort of explains why this happens and also explains why this particular immigrant co community has been very, very uh, successful in in America. So many Asian Americans, you know, originally coming from places like China and Korea came to work on the railroads. Right. Once the railroads are finished, uh, the jobs are given to actually cowboys who are now uh, needing jobs and they're stuck without sort of the main industry. Well, 
as it happens in East Asia, one of the chores that is considered a masculine chore is doing laundry. Like, you know, garbage is masculine, laundry is masculine. That's just what men did. And as, when they came to the New World, they found this huge demand that was needed for, for people to do laundry, growing cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, and no one's really doing this. So they, they, they found this opening. Um, and it didn't sort of mess with their sense of being, being masculine. So, uh, and they, you know, they gain this foothold in this culture. These businesses thrive. They eventually jump into other businesses. Before you know it, um, they're key players in like the larger Silicon Valley tech revolution. Um, so gender sort of is one reason why the Asian American community is, is very successful in the United States. Take a, a different example. Let's jump to World War II. Um, so here we see a picture of some American GIs, right? And some German Freuleins in 1946 in, in Germany. So Germany during World War II is viewed as like this dark, evil, like over-masculine, you know, super mensch fighting, you know, machine that had stormed over France and the rest of Europe. And immediately afterward, there's, you know, a million American GIs in Germany and there's no more young men. Uh, they're dead or they're in prison in the Soviet Union. And you see all these old, frail men, these little boys, and millions and millions of young women that looked just like them, or at least look, look like very many of them, right? And there's rules against uh, getting with these women, with dating, uh, with fraternization, as they called it. Uh, but very quickly, GIs sort of ignore that. They start dating. There's lots of, you know, shotgun weddings and so forth. And almost overnight, right after the war, Germany is perceived as this weak nation that needs America's protection. Almost quickly, Germany becomes one of America's best friends and indeed remains one of America's closest allies uh, in, in the year 2021. So gender relations sort of play a role in this, right? Um, in 2002, uh, America is talking about invading Afghanistan. Now, the technical reason was because Afghanistan at the time ruled by the Taliban, was harboring um, a terrorist uh, of Al-Qaeda known as Osama bin Laden. But if you looked at the news, the entire rhetoric was about gender and the rights of, of women in this country. We need to invade to sort of liberate and free these women who couldn't drive, who didn't have marriage rights, who of course wore things like the Shador and, and so forth. We need to sort of help modernize, to bring enlightenment, if you will, to, to this country. Um, so gender influences things like like war, I want to argue. All right, now let's jump back and look at just a few stories of revolutionary women, and I'll give you your weekly assignment. So to jump back to the Enlightenment period, uh, next week we'll look at some revolutions in America and in France. In both cases, women are involved, and the way they're involved in these conflicts is sort of changing uh, the way men and women understand each other and how women believe they should be viewed in the public. So in America at the time, there is something called coverture regulations. Married women were reliant on their husband's civic status. The husband assumed responsibility for his wife's legal woes and her property. Women should be excluded from the new political freedoms because they were dependent upon man. So not a lot of wives, but the war starts. A lot of these women are now running the farms, right? They're obviously large family gardens, they're doing, they're doing all the work, right? When John Adams is opting politics, right? Um, his wife, Jane Adams, is kind of running, running the business. Uh, and meanwhile, women are getting involved politically. They're organizing boycotts of English goods, right? Women began selling their own clothes, making different food arrangements and finding alternatives for items they were lacking, right? This is where Betsy Ross gets in the story. And when war breaks out, many women join their husbands in military camps. And they have some stories like the famous story of Molly Pitcher, when her husband dies on the battlefield, she takes his place on the cannon firing team. These women did this in part because they they had this new sense of identity tied to the nation state. Um, there's a term called Republican motherhood. In which uh, women in communities, uh, you know, it was tying your sense of uh, identity to to the nation state, being a good mother, you know, education and knowledge is important so we can raise good families. Uh, women are tied intimately to the future of the nation. 
similar things are, are happening in France. Um, in France, uh, as the revolutionary fever picks up, uh, women are writing petition uh, to the third estate, asking to sort of participate in the National Assembly. This is, of course, rejected. But then women kind of take it upon themselves. They march on Versailles in a famous bread ride, asking for, for literally bread as their families were starving. And this own sense of sort of motherhood is there. So women are active participants in the public sphere where they're not supposed to be in this political space. And in the memory of this, they're often sort of remembered as the key players, right? You see this in Eugene Delacroix's very famous 1830 pavy, uh, 1830 painting, uh, Liberty Leading the People, where you see this woman who's personifying the concept, uh, the goddess of liberty, her name is Marianne, leading a nation uh, over over a barricade as the bodies are falling right she's holding the flag of the french revolution the tricolor flag um and brandishing a, a bayonet and a musket with the other as people from different classes sort of join in in her struggle and they're kind of pushing back at this enlightenment notion that the public sphere is only a men's space and in the 1800s you see a series of people of women from around the world who are pushing the boundaries on what is acceptable for women to argue. So uh, in England, Mary Wollstonecraft, mother of the woman who wrote Frankenstein, right, is writing on the rights of women. In America, Sojourner Truth uh, talks about women's rights, right? A former slave. In Argentina, uh, Maria Echenique talks about the emancipation of women. In China, uh, uh, Qi Chin is talking about Chinese women as um, is Bahithat al-Badia of, of Egypt. So your assignment this week is to select one of these five primary sources. There'll be an open forum thread. Um, these are in your, you know, read all five because uh, you'll have some essay, uh, some test questions on them. But um, just describe and reflect on their, their argument. So that is the assignment for, for this week. Look at the, the writings of one of these five individuals in great detail. Now, I want to close with uh, kind of finishing the story, right? What happens um, with the women's movement? Sometimes um, in the 19th and 20th century, it is rebranded as uh, the feminist movement or, or modern feminism. And uh, there's largely three waves. Um, the first wave occurs in the, the 19th and early 20th century. And here, uh, women are mainly fighting for the right to vote, which happens in America in 1919. The second wave reaches reaches its height in the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, this is referring to women's liberation uh, for equal rights and, and social rights. The third wave uh, is more complicated, starts in, in, in around the 90s, and this refers to the continuation, in some ways, a reaction to second wave feminism, as women's rights are incorporated with the right of the working class, um, this acknowledgement that uh, in the past women's right was mostly an upper class white affair. Um, and now you see words like intersectionality being brought to the forefront. You you might, you know, buy into some of this, but not all of this, but uh, just kind of, I'm setting the stage for what what is happening here in the conversation on, on women's rights. Um, all of this in some ways is part of the pushback to the enlightenment rules set 300 years ago. All right, feel free to shoot me an email as always if you have any questions or jump into the office hours. Take care folks, Godspeed. We'll see you next week when we discuss the Enlightenment, I'm sorry, the Atlantic revolutions in France, in America, and in Haiti. And I'll also introduce your writing assignments, which is in the syllabus. Godspeed.